Hi there. Welcome to Stories with Grandma Joan. <laughs> I'm so glad you're here. I hope you're having a wonderful day. Today we're going to read Pippi, Longs Pippi in the South Seas, Chapter 7, and it's called Pippi Goes Ashore. Kirker Kirker that island straight ahead, cried Pippi from the bridge one Sunday morning. No, one sunny morning. They had been sailing for days and nights, for weeks and months, over storm-ridden seas and through calm, friendly waters in starlight and moonlight, under dark, threatening skies and in scorching sun. They had been sailing for such a long time that Tommy and Annika had almost forgotten what it was like to live at home in a little town. Their mother would probably have been surprised if she could have seen them now. No more pale cheeks, Brown and healthy, they climbed around in the rigging just as Pippi did. Gradually, as the weather grew warmer, <clears throat> they had peeled off their clothes, and the warmly bundled up children with two undershirts who had crossed the North Sea had now become two naked skinned brown children in loincloths. What a wonderful time we're having, Tommy and Annika declared each morning when they woke up in the cabin that they shared with Pippi. Often Pippi was already up and at the helm of the ship. A better seaman than my daughter has never sailed the seven seas, Captain Longstocking would often say, and he was right. Pippi guided the hop toad with a sure hand and passed the most perilous underwater reefs and the worst breakers. Now the voyage was coming to an end. Crooker Crooker Dut Island, straight ahead, cried Pippi. There it was, sheltered by green palm trees and surrounded by the bluest blue water. Two hours later, the hop toad made for a little inlet on the left side of the island. All the crookerduts, all the crookerduts, men, women, and children, were on the beach to receive their king and his red-headed daughter. A mighty roar rose from the crowd when the gangplank was lowered. Ursa Makusakara, they shouted, and it meant, Welcome back, fat white chief. Chief Ephraim walked majestically down the gangplank, dressed in his blue corduroy suit, which on the forelock, Friedolf played the, while on the foredeck, Friedolf played the new national anthem of the Kirkerdutz on his accordion. Here comes our chief with a clang and a bang. Chief Ephraim raised his hand in greeting and shouted, Mui Mananama, which meant, Greetings to all of you. He was followed by Pippi, who was carrying the horse. Then a wave of excitement broke out among the Kirkerdets. Of course, they had heard about Pippi and her tremendous strength, but it was something entirely different to see it before their very eyes. Tommy and Annika and the whole crew trooped ashore, but for the time being, the Kirker Kirkerdets had eyes for no one but Pippi. Captain Longstocking lifted her up on his shoulders so that they would be able to have a look at her. Again, an excited murmur went through the crowd. But then Pippi lifted up Captain Longstocking on one of her shoulders and the horse on the other, and the murmur swelled into a roar. The population of the island of Kirkakurdut was 126 people. That is approximately the right number of subjects to have, said King Ephraim. More are hard to keep track of. They all lived in small, cozy little huts among the palm trees. The biggest and finest hut belonged to King Ephraim himself. The crew of the hop toad also had huts where they lived while the ship was laid anchor in the little inlet. The ship was anchored there practically all the time these days. Once in a while, though, there would be an expedition to an island about 50 miles to the north where there was a, and where there was a shop where Captain Longstocking bought snuff. A fine, newly built little hut under a coconut tree was ready for Pippi. There was plenty of room for Tommy and Annika, too, but before they could go into the hut to wash up, Captain Long, Longstocking wanted to show them something. He took Pippi by the arm and led her back down to the beach. Here, he said pointing with a thick forefinger. This is the place where I floated ashore the time I was blown into the sea. The Kirkerduts had put a monument to commemorate the strange event. The stone bore an inscription which read, Kirkerkerdut words, 
This is what it said. Over the great white sea came our fat white chief. This is the place where he floated ashore at the time when the breadfruit trees were in bloom. May he remain just as fat and magnificent as when he came. That's what it said. In a voice trembling with emotion, Captain Longstocking read the inscription out loud for Pippi and Tommy and Annika to hear. Then he blew his noise, nose with gusto. When the sun had begun to go down and was ready to disappear in the endless embrace of the South Seas, the drums of the Kirkerdut summoned everyone to the royal square, which was situated in the middle of the village. There stood King Ephraim's fine throne of bamboo, bedecked with red hibiscus flowers. He sat on it when he ruled. For Pippi, the Kirker Kirkerdats had made a smaller throne, which stood next to her father's. In a great hurry, they had also put together two little bamboo chairs for Tommy and Annika. The roar of the drums grew louder and louder as King Ephraim, with great dignity, mounted his throne. He had taken off his corduroy suit and was dressed in royal regalia, with a crown on his head, a straw skirt around his waist, a necklace of shark's teeth around his neck, and heavy bracelets around his ankles. With great majesty, Pippi took her place on the throne. She was still wearing the same loincloth around her middle, but she had stuck some red and white flowers in her hair to be a bit more, fest a bit more festive. Annika had done the same, but not Tommy. Nothing could make Tommy stick flowers in his hair. King Ephraim had been away from his ruling duties for quite a while, and now he started to rule with all his might. In the meantime, the little crooked that children came closer and closer to Pippi's throne. They were, f oh, here's a picture. Can you see that? They were filled with awe to think that she was a princess. When they reached the throne, <clears throat> they all threw themselves down on their knees before her, touching the ground with their foreheads. Pippi, Pippi quickly hopped down from her throne. What is this, she asked. Do you play hunting for treasures down here too? Wait and let me play with you. And she got down on her knees and started to nose around on the ground. There seem to have been other treasure hunters here before us, she said after a while. There isn't as much as a pin here, that's for sure. I see no treasures. She got back on her throne. Hardly had she sat down when all the children bowed their heads to the ground again. Have you lost something? asked Pippi. In any case, it isn't there, so you might as well get up. Luckily, Captain Longstocking had been on the island long enough to know that the Kirkerdets to learn long enough for the Kirkerdets to learn some of their language. Naturally, they didn't show the meaning of such difficult words as postal money order and brigadier general but they had picked up a lot just the same. Even the children knew the most common expressions such as leave me alone. A little boy by the name of Momo could speak the captain's language quite well and because he used to spend a good deal of time at the huts of the crew listening to the men talking, he could understand quite a bit. A pretty little girl called Moana was also able to make out quite well with the language of the captain. Now Momo was trying to explain to Pippi why they were down on their knees in front of her. You be fine princess, said Momo. I no be fine princess, said Pippi and broken crooked dut. I be only Pippi Longstocking, and now I'm through with this throne business. She hopped down off her throne, and King Ephraim hopped down off his, because now he was finished with ruling for the day. The sun sank like a red ball of fire in the South Seas, and soon the sky was bright with stars. The Crookerduts lighted a huge fire in the Royal Square, and King Ephraim and Pippi and Tommy and Annika and the crew from the Hopstead sat down in the grass and watched the Crookerduts dance around the fire. The rumble of the drums, the exciting dance, the strange perfumes from thousands of exotic flowers in the jungle, the glimmering stars above their heads, Everything made Tommy and Annika feel very strange. The waves of the sea were ceaselessly pounding in the background. 
I think that this is a very fine island said, island, said Tommy afterward, when he and Pippi and Annika had crawled into their beds in their cozy little hut under the coconut tree. I think so too, said Annika. Don't you, Pippi? Pippi was lying there quietly with her feet on her pillow, as was her habit, as was her habit. Mm-hmm, she said dreamily. Just listen to the roar of the waves. Remember, I said, maybe I'd like it so much at Crookedet Island that I'll feel like staying there forever. And that is the end of that chapter. Tomorrow, I'll read to you chapter 8. Pippi Talks Sense to a Shark. I'm so glad you came. I hope you have a wonderful day today. Bye-bye.